everyone, my name is Autumn Dixon and this week is July 17th through the 23rd of the Come Follow Me program for 2023 where we are studying the New Testament. Now, as I was reading this week, one of the things that I was thinking about was some of my experiences with some of my friends of other faiths. And one in particular that came to mind. And this was in regards to prophets. I remember talking to him about why he believed prophets had ceased. And it was the first time that I felt like I had ever gotten an answer that seemed logical to me, where he answered and I was like, oh, actually that could make sense. Like I can see why you believe that, right? I still believed in prophets and that they continued, but it made logical sense. And what he told me is that he believed that prophets had ended with Jesus Christ, just like there were so many things that had been that they got rid of with the law of Moses. Prophets were just another thing that were meant to lead up until the point of Jesus Christ. And then after Jesus Christ, we were just supposed to go off of the Bible. Like I said, it made logical sense to me. I still believed in prophets, but I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because in my mind, God is logical. <laughs> and anyway, I had a lot of respect for his answer and how he had thought through things. And I still have respect for that answer. However, as I was reading through Acts this week, I realized that there is tremendous evidence for the fact that the Lord continued his pattern of prophets after his death and his ascension into heaven. We see it very clearly that the Lord chose Peter as a prophet, right? And that that had not been something that ceased with the law of Moses. Now, in order to determine whether Peter was a prophet, we kind of have to know what a prophet is. That's not necessarily a topic that I feel like is discussed a lot in other faiths. Like they're familiar with stories about prophets, but what a prophet was really for, why the Lord chose them at all, I'm not sure how often that is discussed. And so a great place to look for that is in the Old Testament. So I came to the conclusion that there are kind of two main jobs. There's lots of things that the prophet does. There's kind of two main jobs that I noticed throughout the Old Testament for prophets. The first one is very simple. They are called to testify of the basic gospel of Jesus Christ, which is this. They are called to testify that Jesus Christ is going to come to earth, right? Because this is the Old Testament is going to come to earth and that he will die for our sins and suffer for our sins and he will be resurrected after three days. And that is the basic gospel and prophets are in charge of making sure that that most important fact is spread among Heavenly Father's children. Now, sometimes this testifying of Jesus Christ comes in the form of a restoration. And what I mean by that is, let's look at Moses. So the Israelites had been in bondage for hundreds of years. They had no gospel knowledge at all. <laughs> there was nothing left of the gospel for them. And Moses was called as a prophet to completely restore the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? He came to teach them completely new things about the Lord. It was totally restored because it had been completely lost. Sometimes a prophet's role in this regard in testifying of Jesus Christ is not a restoration so much as it is they, it's their job to continue preaching the same doctrine, making sure it remains unadulterated. So a good example of that is Joshua after Moses. So Joshua was in charge of making sure that the doctrine stayed clear to the Israelites. He didn't have to start from ground zero and restore all the knowledge that had been lost. Moses had done that. But it was his job to make sure the doctrine stayed where it was supposed to be because it was very easy to get confused. Second job that I have noticed with prophets is that they are called to guide in specific generations, that there are specific things that the Lord needs for different generations. And we see this throughout the Old Testament. Once again, Moses is a great example of this. So Moses receives the Ten Commandments and we've all been given the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is doctrine. However, when he comes down from the mount, from receiving the Ten Commandments, the Israelites are all worshiping a golden calf. They're not ready for the Ten Commandments. They need something 
much more intense. Their generation needed more. And because Moses is a prophet, the Lord works through the prophet in order to take care of this generation of his, of his disciples. And he gave the law of Moses to help them. Now, going on to Joshua again. If the people had all of a sudden really been changed by the law of Moses, if they had become soft-hearted and if they had been able to follow the Lord, perhaps the law of Moses would have been taken away earlier. Perhaps. Perhaps. Perhaps they would have been ready for a higher law sooner than they actually were in the Old Testament. And if that had been the case, the Lord would have worked through Joshua not just through random people being like, okay, you don't have to live the law of Moses anymore because that would have been chaos because we already know that the Israelites have a hard time following the law of Moses. But he would have worked through Joshua if he had decided to rescind the law of Moses earlier than he actually did in history. Now, Peter. Peter, after the Savior died, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. Peter fulfills these roles, these jobs that prophets did throughout the Old Testament. He was called by the Savior to go and testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ. After Christ ascends into heaven, Peter goes and they're like, okay, we're going to go fishing again because that's all we know how to do. And Christ comes back and he asks Peter to feed his sheep, to go and preach the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus Christ, to others. That was his job. He was called to testify Jesus Christ, which is exactly what a prophet does. So first box, check. Peter fits the mantle of what a prophet is supposed to be. Now, second job that we talked about is that prophets are called to specific dispensations. They're called to specific generations of people in which they are guided by the Lord according to the needs of the people in that generation. And we see that as well in Acts. So Peter has a vision in Acts 11, Acts 10. He has it in Acts 10. (laughs) He talks about it in Acts 11. But in Acts 10, he has a vision. And he sees all these unclean animals. And the Lord's like, no, sorry, talk about Moses too much. The Lord says, Peter, eat. And Peter's like, I don't eat unclean animals, according to the law of Moses. And the Lord tells Peter If I don't call it unclean, you don't call it unclean. And he has this vision three different times. Now, Peter was called to this specific generation of people who were trying to follow Jesus Christ. Before Peter, before Christ, All throughout the time of the Old Testament, in which we see the ancient Israelites, they weren't really allowed to interact with other Gentiles. They weren't supposed to do it. And that was because the Lord was responding to their individual needs. Every time we saw the ancient Israelites interact with Gentiles, they adopted the religious practices of the Gentiles rather than teaching the Gentiles the gospel. The Israelites couldn't handle it, and the Lord knew that. So through his prophet, the Lord said, do not (laughs) interact with the Gentiles. Just be your own nation on your own. And this changed with Peter. At this point in time, the Jews who were now Christians were prepared to share the gospel with other people. They were ready for it. And so the Lord, through his prophet, decided to extend the gospel to the Gentiles. It changed. The generation that Peter was in needed different instruction than the instruction that was needed for previous generations. And so the Lord worked through Peter. So second job of a prophet, responding to the individual needs of the generation through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that job, check, right? Peter fits both of those jobs of prophet. Now, after Peter does this and he goes and he eats with Cornelius, a Gentile, he is approached by some of the other Jews who are now Christians. He's approached by them. They are, they've all followed the law of Moses and they have been circumcised. And this is what happens. So this is Acts chapter 11 and it's verses two through three. It says, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, so Peter dined with the Gentile and came back to Jerusalem. 
they that were of the circumcision, which is the people who had followed the law of Moses and were not Christian, contended with him, saying, thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. So what are they saying? They're saying, you're breaking the law of Moses. Like, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? And so Peter, as the leader, as the prophet, as the person who has received revelation from Heavenly Father about how to guide the church in this day, he explains to them. And he rehearses his vision to them and how it came to him three times and how he came to learn that it was time to take the gospel to all of the Gentiles, how things have changed. The Lord worked through his prophet to bring about change in his church. Now, going back to this other idea of my friend who had said that the prophets had ended after Jesus Christ. If the Lord had dispensed with calling prophets, why did the Lord not give this vision to everyone? Why didn't he just explain it directly to everybody instead of going through one man, through Peter? Or in the very least, if not telling everybody, why didn't he at least tell all of the apostles, all the other leaders who were also kind of in charge of helping the gospel spread, right? Why did he just work through Peter and then Peter passed on the information to everybody else? It's because the Lord's house is a house of order. He worked through the same organization he has always worked through. He speaks to one man and that man, he speaks to one man when it comes to changes that are supposed to happen in the church, right? He speaks to all of us on an individual basis, but when it comes to changing things in his church, he speaks to one man and that gets dispersed through everybody. Now, another argument that my friend made was that everybody had the Bible. We all have the Bible. And so we don't need a prophet anymore. So let's say that the Lord went with that route, that he just completely went without prophets. And he's like, okay, you have records now. Go with that. How long would it have been, if at all, <laughs> How long would it have been for the Jews turned Christians to figure out that the gospel was supposed to go to the Gentiles? Considering the fact about how hard it was for Peter to grasp that concept, even though he received a vision three times from the Lord, it was hard for Peter to accept that. How long would it have taken everybody else just reading the Bible to be like, oh, maybe we should take this to everybody else too, right? How long would it have taken them to do that if they would have done it at all? Because that would have been really scary with how intense the law of Moses had been in making sure that the Israelites stayed to themselves and did not intermingle with Gentiles. There is, and regardless, regardless of whether that's an argument, whether that's a valid argument, because perhaps they could have read the Bible and been like, okay, yeah, it's time to spread the gospel to everybody. What other changes would they have made? If they had been like, okay, well, if we can change this, well, then maybe we can change this about the gospel too, and then we end up with chaos, right? Now, completely laying these arguments aside, the idea that the Lord just had these records and that they got dispersed to everyone very quickly, <laughs> completely laying that reasoning aside, we have evidence that the Lord called a prophet. We have it in Acts that the Lord sent a vision to Peter to guide his church. He works through one man, Peter. He called a prophet, Peter, to make changes within his church. We see that, and we see this time and time and time and time and time again. Once again, going back to my friend, one of the things that he talked about, we were talking about people, he believes that if you're not baptized, you go to hell. If you don't believe, not baptized. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you just go to hell. No matter how good of a person you are, you go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus Christ correctly. And when I was like, that doesn't make sense with who Heavenly Father is and how he's a perfect father who loves all of his children, right? They, he pointed out a verse, I believe it was in Galatians, it was in the Bible, where it talks about how anyone can look around them and see evidence of God. Now, if this is the case, if this is how the Lord chose to work, then when Cornelius was this righteous man who was seeking out the Lord, praying, giving good things, asking the Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Why did the Lord send Cornelius to Peter? Why didn't he, I mean, he gave Cornelius a vision. <laughs> Why didn't he just send his angels to teach Cornelius the gospel? Why did he send Cornelius to Peter? 
And it was because there was an organization in which the Lord worked. He called the prophet. Not only did the prophet have the correct doctrine, but the prophet had the keys to baptize and to do all of these things in the manner that the Lord wanted. The Lord calls a prophet and he does this <laughs> right after he ascends into heaven. We have evidence that the prophets did not die with the law of Moses. They continued on after the law of Moses. Now, there was an apostasy for a while, but the Lord has restored prophets today. Because why wouldn't he? <laughs> There's no reason why he would not continue to love his children and to send someone to guide the generations before he comes to earth again the second time. Now, Peter fits this description of a prophet, of what we've decided a prophet is. Peter fits this description. But there's another pattern that we read about with, with Peter when it comes to prophets. How often, so we live in a day where there have been plenty of policy changes in the church. Lots of really, really little ones, some bigger ones like the mission age change and Missions have changed a lot. Being able to talk to your family, lots of policies have changed, right? But how often do we get to hear about the stories that surround those policy changes, right? When the mission age changed and that was announced, they didn't explain the story and the circumstances and how it changed. Whether it was over time, they got these feelings and it kind of changed, or whether there was a vision, right? We did not get to read about the story and the feelings of the prophet as they decided on this big policy change for the church. That is not the case with Peter. We get to read about Peter's account about how he felt when he was receiving the revelation about this huge policy change within the church. And it is very indicative, his, his feelings, how Peter felt, and his, how he changed, I feel like is extremely indicative of how our prophets today feel, how prophets must have felt all throughout the generations. Prophets, we love our prophets, and we respect our prophets, and revere our prophets, but they are still just men. <laughs> And what I mean by that is people are extremely, extremely influenced by their circumstances and how they were raised. From the time they are very young, their brains, our brains, build these paradigms about what we believe about the world. And it's not just on an intellectual level, it's on a physical level. Your brain is creating literal connections in the brain between neurons about how we organize the world. Needless to say, it is very hard to change these things. <laughs> and Peter is no different. Peter was a man and he had lived through circumstances <laughs> and he had organized the world according to these circumstances, including the context of the law of Moses. And so I want to read the verse about how Peter changed and how he felt so that we can see Peter as the man that he is, right? To us, it may seem obvious, like, of course, <laughs> the gospel is going to get spread to all of the Gentiles. Like, of course, that, of course, this is a thing. But we were raised in a missionary-centered church <laughs> where from the time we were born, there were missionaries already being sent out, right? So to us, that was easy. But this is how it was for Peter. This is Acts chapter 10. It's verse 17. I'm not going to read the whole verse. It says, Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Peter doubted. He saw this vision three times. And the Lord said, Don't call things unclean if I don't call them unclean. Right? And Peter doubted. And I can imagine Peter struggling with this and being a little afraid. <laughs> When the mantle of prophet comes onto a person, I don't believe it just descends and all of a sudden this person steps into their role and they are completely ready for it and it just becomes easy. I imagine that it's like any other calling. When they are called to do something, when they are called as prophet, 
they get a lot of lessons to learn. And some of those lessons are really hard and they are coached through these lessons, right? We saw with Joseph Smith all the time, Joseph Smith had some hard lessons as he was learning and being a prophet. Even after he was called as a prophet, he was still learning hard lessons. The pressure that Peter must have felt to lead the church right. Because he knows he's imperfect. Peter knows he's imperfect. Peter knows about all the mistakes that he made while he was trying to follow Christ. Peter knows that he was just a fisherman three years ago. And now he's in charge of leading Christ's true church on the earth. He knows he's imperfect and he knows that the Lord lets us make mistakes sometimes. And so when he sees this vision that completely changes all of the paradigms that he has formed in his life surrounding the law of Moses... He doubted and was a little bit afraid because of the pressure that was on him. The pressure to lead the church correctly, to not teach false doctrine. Because the law of Moses had been so ingrained. The law of Moses was so intense, right? You could get in so much trouble for doing things that were against the law of Moses. And for Peter to come forward and to get rid of such a big policy, such a big part of the law of Moses, he was probably really worried that he was interpreting the vision correctly because he knows he was imperfect. He wanted to make sure that he had it right before he went and changed everything, before he went and led the church astray, right? And I have felt this in my own small little corner. (laughs) I'm not a prophet. I don't have all of that responsibility and pressure laid on me. But I have felt it to a smaller degree as I have tried to blog and do these videos for YouTube, there have been so many times that I have been afraid that I will speak wrong, (laughs) that I will say something that's not accurate, that I will teach false doctrine. (laughs) And not, I'm not going to teach anything like, oh, Jesus isn't the Christ. That's not what I'm teaching. But there are smaller things that I am afraid that I'll teach as doctrine and it'll get carried away and it'll affect somebody's testimony. I... I'm afraid that I'll emphasize some principle to the, and it, I emphasize the principle so much that another principle is pushed down and not regarded as closely. And I felt it in my own little corner, afraid that I'll preach something wrong and it'll be out there on the internet forever and it could potentially affect someone's testimony, right? I felt that pressure and I can only imagine how much pressure a prophet feels to do what's right, to try and interpret things from the Lord correctly. (laughs) I can only imagine how much pressure a prophet feels knowing that they had a different career their entire life, (laughs) that they had been doing something else their entire life before they were called to be a prophet. These prophets are also men. (laughs) And I think, I sincerely believe that if we could step into their shoes for just a minute and feel what they feel, their testimonies and their faith, the Lord will lead them, but also to feel the amount of pressure that they feel to try and follow the Lord correctly. I don't think we would ever feel a need to judge them again. (laughs) If we could feel how sincerely they were trying to follow the Lord, even though they were imperfect men, I think we would feel a lot more compassion for them and a lot more motivation to pray for them. (laughs) I am grateful for the Lord. I am grateful that he established a pattern long ago, a pattern that helps his people, that makes sure the doctrine is there and remains pure. I'm grateful that he chooses prophets so that they can give us guidance when things change and when generations are different. I am grateful that we get to read about it and learn. (laughs) And I am grateful for my Savior and what he has done for me. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.